Around six, we're going to like circle it in, and if you want to ask questions, it's going to get cozy and fun and kind of intimate. Um, so I'm really excited that you're all here on a late Friday afternoon. Congratulations for making it here and for making a commitment and having some fun on the process too. With that, I'm Amy Wenslow. My company is Products to Profits. We work at the intersection of product development, sales, and marketing for consumer goods. So if you've heard of a company like, oh, Walmart, Target, CVS, um, Home Depot, Lowe's, we have clients that have gotten in all of those. We sell, our clients sell to over 43 plus major retailers. Um, and I evaluate different pitches for the Clean Tech Open, the Port of Los Angeles, and I speak for the US Patent and Trademark Office on commercialization specifically. So we're very involved with building investor pitches and in harnessing creativity on the planet. That's our company mission. And with that, we get to see a lot of things, a lot of startups, and a lot of people that are really up to building their dream and their legacy. So that's really where the topic for today came out of a conversation that I was having with two dear friends. And one of them is Desiree. So if you were here at four o'clock, you heard Desiree's experience. She has real estate background, massive, massive background in entrepreneurship across many, many different categories. She'll, she'll be one of our panelists. And before we jump into taking your questions, which really is our main focus, we want to take questions. Whether it's on legacy and purpose, or investing, or how to attract investors, that's what we want to be about today. Before we launch into that, I want to turn the microphone over to somebody who's extremely, extremely special. Julia Diltz was the co-founder of Maverick Angels, or is the co-founder, I guess would be the way to say that. She, her company is Papillon Ventures, and Julia has massive, okay, everybody, massive, right? Okay, say it with me, come on. Oh my God. Massive. Background in angel investing in the very elevated state of just before venture capital. So we're talking, this isn't like, hey, people that needed $5,000. We're talking, this is serious deals. And syndicating the deals across different angel investing networks as well. So I wanted to introduce you to Julia because not only is she an incredibly savvy, experienced, heartfelt investor, she loves entrepreneurs. She loves <laughs> the startup game and that world. So Julia has some hard-won lessons that she's actually uh, going to be sharing with us. And this is such a rare treat. Julia doesn't really speak a whole lot in the United States anymore. She does most of her speaking internationally, so she's kind of like the hidden gem, and you're getting a secret look behind the curtain. <laughs> How cool is that? So with that, Julia Dills, please share some of your, your lessons because oh they're extraordinary. Well, this is not about me today. This is about you guys. So I'm just gonna give you like a 30 second elevator pitch about what I do, who I am. I started out as a magazine journalist, actually, and I morphed into an angel investor on an angel investment company, uh, spoke around the world about entrepreneurship and how each culture is different in the way that they approach entrepreneurship and of course they, wanna, they love how Americans do it. We are the gold standard of entrepreneurship to the world. So we have a responsibility of being the best, of having integrity, and doing it with purpose, and making an impact. And also, if you choose, as a legacy. So I've been an investor, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, I speak, I teach, and I learn. And I learn most of all from you guys. So that was my 30 second elevator pitch, and I invite you to ask me any question, your burning questions, that you have that I can help share my experience. Um, if it's about getting investment, I've heard that many times, obviously, that's fine. If it's about your pitch and how to pitch correctly down to, uh, to investors, that's okay. If it's a more personal thing like, wow, how do I get through the hard days? How do I make payroll? How do I make it happen? I've been there before, so I, I can speak to that too. So I'm gonna open it up 
to the audience and feel free, please. Consider me as your friend. You're talking to a friend and uh, that's how I feel about you guys because I'm one too. I'm an entrepreneur first before I'm an investor and I think like an entrepreneur and I know the, I know the road. I'm a journalist too. <laughs> so who has a question? If not, I have a great one for these two ladies that I'd love to ask. You have a question? Yeah, so how do you, like you're, as an investor, you know, you always hear in these stories about people like, get users, get users, fill up a lot of users, or there's the revenue question. Like, how do you look at it, or how would you recommend somebody this? For what we're doing right now, we're trying to look at it. We've got a lot of users growing, but the revenue isn't there yet. Okay. So how do you look at that? Well, a lot of times when we talk to investors, they said, hey, you're still friends and family until you get some money coming in. Right. And yet you see others where they're like, some of these companies have never had any money, but they had, you know, 100,000 users in certain areas, and it's really high. Well, I would say that you're not like everybody else, number one. You're a unique company, so therefore, think about what you're doing. Of course, look around you. You know, don't have blinders. Look around you and see what other people are doing. However, you're on a different path. So what I would say to that is if you're hearing that enough from it, angel investors, I would say, okay, continue on your path with more users because, of course, we want to see that market traction, clearly, and I know you've heard this before. So, as far as revenue, continue on with your um, friends and family raise and net it down to, I would say just, just ask for enough to get you by for the next benchmarked round. You don't need to fund your entire company for the next five years. That is a huge mistake. You have to plan it out. Like I say, your exit starts on day one that you decided to do this company. You consistently have to think about your acquirers and you should be getting to know your acquirers now. So who, like what Amy and Desiree had said earlier, who you're in company with is extremely impressive to us as investors. So it's kind of, the answer is, you focus on both. And the more, I mean, I hate to say that, now is the time, if, you have, if you're not raising money yet, is the time that you start raising your friends and family. Have you raised money? Yeah, we raised money. How far are you in your round? Uh, well, we're just doing friends and family, so that's... Or, or I, I call it a round still. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're coming to the end of it. Because um, okay. I think we're at a point where we've built the bridge far enough to where we can get to the next point. If that makes any sense. Yes, it does. You don't want to build the bridge and get short and have everybody upset with you. So we build it far enough to where we're probably at the next point. But I think we need to bring the revenue model up to make investors feel better. I think that's a, a great um, answer is the revenue uh, model. Take a look at the revenue model. And also, not every um, investor is going to be interested. Go with the ones who are with you and leave the rest behind. There are investors who are going to believe in you. And they're going to give you that capital because they like you. Number one rule, I only invest in people I like. If you're a jerk, and I used to have this policy in Maverick Angels, I had a no jerk policy when, it, when I vetted my own investors in my club as well as entrepreneurs. If an entrepreneur was a jerk, they were so out of there. Because it's a marriage. We are married to you. So I would say get to know Pasadena Angels and get to know the network around you because people do believe in you. And, and I've, I've written checks and I know other people have written checks because they like to. It's like I'll throw just five or 10,000 at them. No problem. I don't have to do any due diligence. I like them. It happens more than you think. So why don't we build on that? So we're in the pet industry. So, oh, we, so we feel very strongly about the fact that if you don't have a dog or a cat or, or, in, or understand pets, like that's one of the first questions we, in our, if you want to call it our interview of an investor as well, it's like, do you like pets or do you have a pet industry? Do you think that's a, we're being too harsh if they don't have any pets or they don't understand the pet industry to say they probably don't get what we do? You know, I think that we'll take this offline. I'd like to take a look at, um, maybe a few slides or you can tell me a little bit more and give me a, a, provide a pitch to me so I can let you know a, a more a deep down, you know, truthful answer. Off the top of my head, it's very difficult to formulate that. So meet me after class, please. Okay. okay. To piggyback on that, um, we work a lot in the pet industry. I mean, a lot. We have four or five deals right now in front of a major corporation in pet products. So. Sometimes you'll find a company that's willing to invest um, separately than an angel investor and they'll partner with you. We actually have that situation happening right now. Um, 
And whether your investor gets the industry, a lot of times they'll get the numbers and they'll get the story of the numbers if you create it in a compelling way. Because they're used to looking at deals. So I love that Julia's offering herself up to take a look with you. That's awesome. Um, does that help you? Yeah, it does. I mean, it does. It's just when you're in that friends and family trying to get into that initial angel round, it, to me, it's helpful that they understand the industry because there is a little bit of a faith. No matter what the numbers are, there's still a belief in, I get what you're doing, I understand that from the perspective of the panel. That's just kind of where I'm at, but I'd be mean, very interested to hear what goes. I think I have some ideas. I think the humanity part of it is going to be a big, big portion of that. <coughs> Everyone has a soft spot for a little kitty or dog here in an or You say you have a platform for rescue dogs. Okay, okay. Oh, that, that's fabulous. And it's impact. So, you know, uh, I believe that most investors have animals. So uh, I know I do, and I love my dog and cat, and so you basically are is a family member. So no, okay, we'll put that on ice. Because uh, I'd love to take some more uh, questions question over here. Uh, just, just related to the friends and family and yes. investing is, is Kickstarter still the best way, or is that a, uh, is that a way? That's Kickstarter is a great way. Okay. I I love Kickstarter. Uh, I also love Indiegogo as well for the more creatives in the room. Uh, actually, what's wonderful about crowdfunding is we as, event, as angel investors look at it as market traction. If you kick butt when it comes to a crowdfunding platform, then we're going to take a look at that because your customers are interested. And if your customers are interested, then we say, hey, there's something to this company. So yes, I'm a firm believer in Kickstarter. Yes. And we, we have had client we have client projects that convert from Kickstarter into larger races. Do you see uh, the, the conversion, conversion rates on uh, higher wins have like a solid brand? I mean, is the brand a big part of that? Or just, I mean, it's a good story. Because I mean, I'm in, it's obvious selling to whatever it is you're, you're looking for investment. So. Do you mean in terms of having a successful Kickstarter <laughs> campaign? Yeah, I guess it's successful. I think having a compelling offer to the market is more successful in Kickstarter. You can have a great brand and your offer can just be horrific and people still won't come in. Right. And gone are the days of Kickstarter driving the traffic that's going to prove your campaign. You have to go in prepared to drive traffic and do it massive split testing. Um, when we're seeing successful campaigns, we're seeing they may have tested upwards of 200 ads variations. Um, small amounts at first and then moving into bigger dollars. One thought I was uh, what I'm going to add to, even the gentleman with the, the uh, dog food. Uh, sometimes, even the person does, like you mentioned, Amy, they don't even like the product, so they look going after the numbers. But also, he has a huge market for cause marketing. Some people don't have anything to do with it, but that's a company. Remember, I was talking about joint ventures and affiliates. Maybe that industry or that project it complements what they're doing. So they would just be part of it because of the cause they would represent. Like some uh, uh, credit card companies are now getting involved with women's organizations because they want to be able to market for them so it's a cause market. So that's one way. And then also being able to create enough partners and joint ventures so that we could do the crowdfunding, we could do your uh, any other kind of funding, you have those associates because investors do look at who you're affiliated with, who you associate with, and who else is supporting your your mission, your energy. Um, talk about the different crowdfunding, a lot of them too is that being able to really dive into your markets and again collaboration. Your crowdfunding campaign will be much more partnered, much more better if you partner with others that has the same mission and the same diet that will be able to share with their social media, share with their community, share it with their bases. Because if you alone shouldn't try to do it alone, it really takes a lot of movement to be able to do a successful campaign. So being able to bring everybody else along with that, you know, again, whether it's associations, whether it's nonprofits, whether it's individuals, whether it's books, authors, and get everybody that you can to support that and be a part of that because they will bring along their tribes with you. And that adds up. Um, to all three uh, of the panelists on this uh, uh, stage. I have a, a wellness platform as a, a, with an employee benefit. Any suggestions on how to approach uh, getting into the door with HR folks? Mm. Yeah, this is more of a, I think this is a baby question. <laughs> um, <laughs> First off, you have to understand what it is they are evaluated on. Um, 
because their interest, if you're looking at HR folks, those are employees that have performance metrics. And if your product helps them meet their performance objectives, you'll do a lot better. So their performance object objectives should be employee vitality, retention, training, all of those things. Um, so they have that, but they also get measured on employee turnover, which is the other side of the retention board, right? So you actually have to figure out their, um, like what's going to make them look stellar to their boss, and how does your tool do that? So yes, you're talking about the, the features of the product, but the benefit really is how it helps them do their job better, okay? So speak it in their language, too. Um, you might have some of your own vocabulary. Please don't use it. We've heard pitches where people, a very engineer, I'm sure you've heard these, Julia, like engineers go on, like seriously, PhD of physics, their one time, I was just like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. And I was listening to it from a market perspective because um, just because somebody doesn't understand your language doesn't mean they can't write you an investment check, right? So put it in words that a normal human being can understand because you don't know how long that HR manager may have been in their job. Figure out what they, what will have them look stellar though. Start with that. And then you'd want to be looking at what are the associations that they're in? There's a trade association for freaking everything. And I used to be very involved in one. I was director of operations for it. And we were constantly looking for benefits that we could offer to our members. So if you can build a benefit program, we actually built the FedEx DVX service in Los Angeles because we did it as a, as a member benefit through a trade association. And literally, our membership hit a 100-year high because they paid for their membership in three months, and it was an annual membership just on the shipping savings. So if you can create things like that, FedEx was literally driving members to our door. It was crazy. Look for those kind of partnerships. 